first of all, hi, and thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview with me. How are you guys doing? We're fine, thank you. Yeah, very good. Uh, we had an awesome record release party just with the band um, last Friday. We went for a meal and then, then had a small home party. So it went pretty late, but it was very fun. <laughs> yeah. It's very good to see people because we don't see that much each other at the moment. Yeah. So are you still recovering from that party or <laughs> are you feeling fresh? Yeah, well, sure. Mostly <laughs> fresh, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, anyhow, like you mentioned, you released your new album Genesis last Friday. Uh, how have the reactions been? I suppose you got many reviews and many comments from friends and people you don't know. Yeah, um, well, you guys gave an awesome review. And it seems like um, most of the reviews have also been giving eight or nine out of ten. So it's it's been really, really good. And the reviewers have been lifting us in the same category as our idols, like Symphony X and Dream Theater. So that's, I think, I think this is probably the strongest album we have done up to date. And um, it's very encouraging for the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, let's start off a little bit by talking maybe about you, you guys. Um, you mentioned that, you know, Symphony X and Dream Theater are your heroes and stuff like that. But I think there are plenty of, of other references there present. And a lot of people seem to compare it with a whole lot of other prog bands, such as Periphery, which I thought also was kind of interesting. What do you guys think about that? I think most of the 70s elements are missed sometimes. Uh, I would say like a, a gentle giant is something that you can hear from some of the parts in some of the songs for example and nobody has mentioned that yeah. kind of influence yeah and my favorite keyboard player probably of all time isn't the dream theater guys <laughs> <laughs> though i i do um they are also my idols but um but um keith emerson of emerson lake and palmer he, he was like the ultimate keyboard wizard in back in the 70s and also which i like he was a superb performer and he did very entertaining um, shows and tricks with his keyboards on stage so um yeah you can hear some keith emerson in my playing i think yeah for me in in the song the human equation i heard a lot of yes in the chorus that was really cool to me because i'm a huge yes fan so props to that <laughs> I never actually listened a lot to Yes, but um, but sometimes it happens that um, two composers that haven't listened to each other very much might have a very similar sense of melody and harmony. Like mm -hmm. Oli mm -hmm. says that um, often my um, harmony sounds like the composer from the old Zelda games. No, actually it's uh, Nobuo Uematsu, which is from uh, Final, uh, Final Fantasy, Fantasy series. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I've picked a lot of things that are very close. And it's like this collective thinking that we share, each musician. I can see that, that's cool. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, let's also start to talk maybe about the writing process in general. So your previous album was released six years ago. Um, I'm wondering why the long waiting period? in between um well i was a little burned out after the last album and then um i got picked up for a, an english band called eden's curse which has light prog influences but it's more like of a hard rock or melodic metal band and um but Eden's Curse was quite established in the UK already. So we had um, big tours with um, with Freedom Call. We toured Germany. And then we did some big festivals. And um, also we warmed up for Michael Schenker in the UK. And they were like huge, huge venues. 
and uh, that was kind of an adventure I had to go on, but it definitely slowed down the process of making this album for Simulacrum. And um, then also um, um, our previous drummer, we um, in mutual understanding um, changed drummer. So we, it took a while to find Tatutorun and, and then it took a while for him to rehearse everything so we could like drive him in the band. And then also um, Niklas was as a special guest when Adamantra played at Tuska Festival. And that, that was the, when the idea came in my head that we should have two singers because Niklas was singing backing vocals for Tuomas, the singer of, of Adamantra. And then, um, then it took a while to find Eric, though he was our <clears throat> friend already for a while here in, in Turku. But um, we tested also some other guys, but then Eric joined the band in the end. And then, then we had to start thinking and arranging the songs we had already made again for two singers. So it, there was a lot going on, but Actually, our record deal says that um, 2023 we have to have a new album. <laughs> so it's every. It's going to be so at least a year. <laughs> yeah, so it's going to be every three years now. <laughs> but I have to say that there was also delay because of last year because it was a bit special and we got the record deal and it made this kind of bureaucracy kind of delay. Yeah, the the album masters were already sent last spring so it was like almost a year for the them to be able to release it because the um covid uh, messed up all their logistics mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah um that yeah i guess that it has messed up quite many things actually but enough about that um uh did you guys start writing already like five years ago then or did you start around the time that Corona happened or whatever. What is the time frame for this? We started probably writing maybe half a year after Sky Divided was released. Just like the initials, riffs and songs. The first songs we completed were Traumatized and Scorched Earth. So those we worked with Petri together on those. And that was also something new because I had written the two previous albums by myself. Now, did you have, other than, I guess, uh, the time frame and, and like COVID, did you have any kind of challenges while making this record or did the process go pretty smooth once you got started? When we got the members, right? So when we got Tatu as a drummer, I think from that on, it went pretty smooth. So it, it has just been, um, well, a lot of different things. And like Christian said, he was very busy with the side projects, which were pretty big things. So I think it's pretty natural that you have a delay because of those. And the projects are just getting bigger because I'm now doing the keyboards for James Lebris. So, so, <laughs> so um, mm. but um, yeah, we have to get this new album <clears throat> completed within the next three years so mm. so it's so it's going to be a bit more organized now that yeah. we have a record company behind us we have a deadline mm. so we have to meet the deadlines and then we get these albums out mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but you know i guess because of corona you have a bit more time because you can't tour or anything so luckily that can go towards writing i guess or something. yeah three years is enough to do a progressive metal album so yeah. It doesn't have to take six years to do it, but it, you just have to be a little bit more focused. But I would say two years might be a little tight to do this artistic music because you don't complete a, a composition in a week. It might actually take a year to figure everything out for a long song. Hmm. How does it usually go for you to go about a song? Because they're so layered and so detailed. And it's even when you listen to it the first time, you can't grasp it from the first time, basically. So how does it, that process usually go? Well, um, if I talk about my own compositional style, 
I um, I use a notation software. So sometimes I might not even touch the piano when I'm composing. I have stuff in my head. And then because I have a classical background and and have been doing this for a long time, I can just like drop the notes into the score and then the computer plays it back to me as what it sounds like. And um, yeah, it's it's more of like composing a classical song than a heavy metal song. It's it, in a traditional heavy metal um, compositional style, the guys would maybe be jamming at the rehearsal studio, but I do it like this, that I write the full score for the whole band, then I print each guy's their parts, but I, I, I let them um, tweak all the riffs and their own, to get their own flavor into the compositions. So that's the first step, that we get the footprint of the song uh, by doing that. But then I think the biggest change is when you arrange the vocals, then you get all these new ideas and, of course, from the uh, other musicians. So it, I think it goes through a big change process. But it starts from a scratch. I mean, you have just the black and white notes and that's all. But it does change a bit from there still. Yeah, <clears throat> I don't write any vocal melodies, or I haven't up, up to now. Uh, so I let the singers figure that out, and then I pro produce the vocals with them. And but um, yeah, that that changes the song also. Yeah, whatever they, whatever they come up with. <laughs> so I guess to be able to join your band, you have to be able to read scores and notes. <laughs> Preferably, yeah. <laughs> Preferably, oh. yeah, but um, but um, Tattoo didn't read any notes before he joined the band. Now he reads a little, so um, it's not a necessity, but no, it's, it's, it does help a lot. <laughs> but it, but it's, it's, I think it's required that it's, it, it makes it a lot easier if you can read scores, because otherwise Tattoo would have to just like listen and listen to what I've done but now he can listen and try and read at the same time and figure it out quicker. Now um, in comparison to your previous records what do you think uh, Genesis sounds like and how does it differ? Oli actually listened to all three albums today so he can answer <laughs> this one. <laughs> okay uh, I think it has gone uh, to the roots. Uh, I mean, it's pretty close to the first album, Master and Simulacrum. And it has a lot more of those 70s elements and those things that it is something that we've grown up with. I mean, we're not from the 70s, but it's the, the root of our inspiration is, is actually from there. So I think basically we have um, a lot of those and many people have said that it's like two different parts in the album. You have the A side, the B side, and the A side is actually mm, more up to date, you could say that. And the B side is the, the um, root influence. So I think it's more diverse to me. Yeah, and I think even though that like uh, rhythmic distortions is probably why people um, say it sounds like periphery because it has those chunky, genty riffs. Um, but um, but I think um, all the songs anyway fit on the same album because of the same type of sound production and the same vocalists and it all fits well together. And, and I think this album um, has the whole spectrum of progressive music starting from the 70s and ending in today. Yeah, it feels like you kind of made an ode to the genre in a way to me. But I guess that yeah. was not intentional, but that's just what I thought. <laughs> that, that's a very, very nice compliment. Yeah, Thank a good you. way to prove it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. Now, as you mentioned, um, many people have uh, think that um, the album consists out of two parts, kind of, and you have then the, their uh, genesis. 
Um, now, the first part of Genesis, um, the Celestial Architect, was also part of your debut album, I think, or maybe the second one, I don't remember. Um, was it always your goal, kind of, to make this long, epic track out of that one, or is that something you came up with later on? Yeah, that's why it says Genesis Part 1 also on the first album. I was, I actually um, think my mindset was back then that the next album would start with Genesis Part 2. But then um, that never happened. And then I decided that, that for this album I will make the missing parts that I kind of had already in my head somewhat and um but then um it 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 felt it felt like a silly idea that we wouldn't re-record the first part because lots of people have probably lots of people who will listen to this album haven't heard the first album and also the sound quality is a lot better now mm -hmm. Do you think that you might, is the story now finished or is it something you might have in future albums as well? I think that story is finished. Okay, cool. this, this was my, um, this was my huge epic song. And, and I think the next album won't have a 30 minute song on it. But let's see then the next album after that. Maybe I will, <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe I will find the energy again to do something like this, but it's a, huge job to do a half a minute half an hour song <laughs> yeah exactly and i guess because you also made it so in a way that everything also works by itself it seems like even more complex that it somehow flows still nicely as a whole but then also you can listen to it separately yeah that's why i wanted to divide it onto four separate tracks because some people might be in the mood just to listen to the third part, which is a nice, um, I would call it maybe a dark jazz influenced ballad. So somebody just might be in that mood on a particular day and they want to listen just to that. So. Now, when I was looking at the track list, that song kind of stood out to me, I guess, um, because there's a progressive metal concept album also named uh, the same. Uh, so it's a human equation. I don't know if you know the album by Arion, but I was wondering, like... That's, that's an accident. Uh, oh, I now I understand the comment on YouTube. Okay, this is new <laughs> information to me. <laughs> yeah, that, that's an accident. I, I actually realized it when I read um, the review. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but um, uh, I don't think it matters. <laughs> <laughs> they made an album called that. Do they have a song called The Human Action? Yeah, that too. Um, yeah. He just well, that well Dream Theater has a song called A New Beginning, which was our mm -hmm. on our previous album, but we did it first, actually. So, mm -hmm. so they copied the name from us. <laughs> <laughs> As I understood it, so Genesis well, is a concept by itself. And the other songs, they kind of have separate themes that are not connected. But what are some of the themes you guys sing about or write about? Uh, do you mean the songs or, or the lyrics? Which yeah, side? Uh, the lyrics. The lyrics. Hmm. That's a good question. I think there's a lot of very simple themes of life. Um, maybe something like uh, about the progression of a human being for example how you grow up and yeah. how things change how your thoughts may become a bit different or from a different point of view so i think it's pretty much about basic things very basic yeah the first five songs have um, very um connected to life experience lyrics and um, but then the genesis songs have all this gra grand sci-fi themes about evolution of the universe and and humans and where humans are going but still about humans and the way humans evolve in a bigger scale of course 
Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's yeah. the theme. Yeah. Um, human growth mm -hmm. in the whole say. album. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it will be interesting to see what you have done with the next album, considering that uh, humans are right now all over the place with this whole Corona thing. Mm. Maybe we will concentrate on the growth of insects and yeah. how they evolve <laughs> in this. <laughs> Forget humans on the next album. Now, I was also told to ask you about the Chapman stick, which is something you play. Um, I was wondering, how did you start playing that instrument? And have you at all used it in similar from and are you planning to, if not? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's something that I want to include to every um, song that it it um, kind of d serves some purpose. I mean, it has to serve some purpose. And in every album, we have one or two songs that I play with Chapman Stick. So it's basically, uh, I'm, I try to include it, but still it has to serve the song the song comes first and that's how it uh, comes to me at least so but i picked it up actually uh, i saw tony levin first uh, using chapman stick in liquid tension experiment so that's where i picked it up and then i just knew that i want to have the similar sound and flexibility in, in the playing so yeah i'm trying to include it as much as I can. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, the, on, on this album, like you, like me, uh, um, is played on the Chapman stick. Yep. So you can hear it has a much more of a percussive um, quality to it when you tap the yeah. strings mm. com compared to um, a normal bass. Mm. Yeah, it seems like a quite impressive instrument to play. I wouldn't know where to start. <laughs> Yeah, it's a bit like a piano, actually. Yeah. Very similar. Yeah, you can just you can play with two hands. So mm. you, could, you could play um, songs on the Chapman stick if you were really skilled. You play on the piano, so you could play. Um, I'm sure Bach sounds very nice on a Chapman stick. I think stick. maybe we could demonstrate uh, from the first album, Flagiston, sometimes as a duet, because it's uh, composed for Chapman stick. And it's an instrument or song, and it's very glued to the keyboard. I've always liked it. Yeah, we could maybe yeah, do we that, just, do as a, well. just as a piano Chapman stick yeah. combo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, why not? Hmm. Anyway, uh, because of the pandemic, obviously, uh, well, I cannot really ask about shows. So I have to ask you um, if you are planning to do any concert streaming type of thing. We had... Um, we had a, a few release shows booked for the spring, but we had to um, at least move them forward, probably to the autumn. Um, but um, I don't know about the streaming thing. Um, I, I personally think it's so lame compared to a real live experience. So, um, but uh, we'll have to think about it. If this stretches on and stretches on, then then if we can find a good stage somewhere maybe here in the Turku area that we could do a streaming show from. But I would like it then to be a good show with good lights and, and a good stage, then, then possibly. But um, let's see how this pandemic um, progresses from here. And we definitely want to play real life shows that are uh, unique experience a different unique experience every evening yeah i can imagine that you guys must also be looking forward to playing live after this album release what songs do you think will be the most interesting for you to play well i think the b side as a whole would be very interesting yeah we can't do it all yet at the moment but um <laughs> <laughs> we, we'll, we, we, would, we will have to rehearse that. But um, yeah, um, I think this um, Genesis Part 2, Evolution of Man, the instrumental, will be very fun to play live. Yeah. Do you 
plan to play it as a whole? Um, well, as you said before, they also work separately. I think it depends on what kind of show we have. If we have a warm-up slot, say for a bigger band, um, then we can't do a half an hour song. <laughs> so then we would just pick maybe one of the parts from there. But um, if we have a one and a half hour headline show, then that would be very nice. Makes sense. <laughs> Um, okay, I think that's it for my questions. Do you have any last thoughts you want to share with people who are watching this? Um, just that um, I know it's a bummer that this virus situation is what it is, but we really hope that you will remember us um, when the pandemic has passed and come and see us live because um, I've heard from so many people that we are even better live than we are on albums. I would say that be patient and, well, it will be over at some point. So we'll see then. <laughs>